Thanks to Aeronaut for hosting us, to SCAT TV for televising these, and to Somerville Local First for co-sponsoring. So tonight I have um, Aaron Cohen of Gracie's, who's uh, just, I think, the most multi-passionate speaker that we've ever had at the series. Um, he's managed wedding bands, he's worked for marketing companies, he runs you know, multiple events, um, a whiskey-oriented event, a bacon and beer fest, and he also, of course, uh, founded and runs Gracie's, um, which is really well known for its ice cream here in town. Um, so uh, he's going to introduce himself and tell his story, and then we're going to do, um, I'm going to do some Q&A with him, and then we're going to open it up and have the audience be able to ask him your burning questions. Um, and afterwards, we invite you to hang out, uh, stick around. There's going to be music in the main beer hall and um, cool people to get to know and to talk to. So, Aaron? Um, so this is my first PowerPoint. Uh, and I think that if we all bear together, we can get through it. Um, I had a, yeah, I, I started a, a Twitter account called Eat Boston in 2009 that was about uh, food media it was food media about restaurants and um, food news in the city. And I started doing events to promote the Twitter account and then quickly realized that I liked doing events more than uh, talking about food and have used the Twitter account to now talk mostly about restaurants, uh, the food, the events that I do. Um, the first uh, big event that I did was the, the Bacon and Beer Fest, which was in the Trolley Barn at 540 Harrison Ave uh, in Boston. It's uh, this gigantic, beautiful brick building, and um, we had 1,600 people, 40 or 50 food vendors, and uh, ran out of food in the first 45 minutes. It was a, a total shit show. Um, and then uh, from there, I started doing some more events, including uh, Boston's first pop-up restaurants. Uh, you might recognize this is um, Block 11, which my partner Will Gilson and I turned into a fine dining restaurant for three nights in um, February of 2010. Um, we, we also did uh, pop-up restaurants in a chocolate factory, a furniture store, a hair salon, uh, pretty much anywhere. Um, then we went down to the Cape and ran a restaurant for the summer uh, as the pop-up, which did poorly. Um, from that, I, I did more events, Ice Cream Showdown, Taco Apocalypse, Monsters of Pork, Lobster Party, BLT Battle at Sea, Guacaholics Anonymous, and um, Steakcation, which was over the, the 4th of July weekend. And um, I was trying to figure out how to market an event, market an event during that time. and was kept thinking that it, like people on staycation might come to that. Um, so we called it Steakcation, and it was a, a harbor cruise uh, featuring meat, essentially. Um, I started, uh, oh, and then uh, Bacon and Beer Fest expanded to seven cities across the country, um, which we've, we've done every year since, since 2010. Um, the, the next one is, is June 12th in Boston and in Austin on the same day, um, I will be in Boston. I started managing a wedding band uh, during the last couple of years. Um, we took it from one band doing two gigs a year to three bands doing 65 gigs a year. Um, and I'm not doing that anymore, but I am happy to talk to you about the wedding industry because it is um, expensive. Uh, I started an, an online art gallery uh, called Super Precious Art Gallery, which is uh, the one theme is uh, these artists that, that do really strong illustration um, as opposed to graphic design. Um, and every couple months we would give them a theme um, and they would, they would come up with um, a poster print that, that uh, matched that theme. Uh, so we did tacos and burritos, punctuation, fairy tales. We've done Groundhog's Day a couple times uh, in keeping with the movie. I did a conference called Up, Up, Down, Down, which was about side projects um, that give you extra life, kind of like uh, Up, Up, Down, Down is the first uh, couple notes of the Konami code, which gives you 30 extra lives in the Nintendo game Contra. Um, 
Gracie's Ice Cream, which is around the corner. We make our own ice cream in-house. Uh, we love Choco Tacos. Then uh, this winter, I started doing toddler dance parties in uh, rock clubs, which um, basically my daughter will go to the park during any weather. And in order to stay outside or stay out of the cold in the winter, um, I asked the guys at Thunder Road if we could take over the club for a couple hours in the afternoon on a Saturday. And uh, toddlers dance around to 80s hip hop and uh, 90s indie music. Uh, while their parents drink beer. Um, and then coming full circle, I started doing uh, a beer and wine garden at SOA um, every Sunday this year. And it's in the trolley barn at 540 Harrison Ave, which is uh, where the first Bacon and Beer Fest was. So uh, if you guys are down at SOA, you can have a beer in this really gorgeous building. OK, so um, you started the Bacon and Beer Fest, and it started with a building, right? And um, at the time, you also, um, so uh, Aaron runs Eat Boston, the Twitter handle, which has, I think, 50,000 followers at this point, right? So can you tell us the, the, those two stories and how you're, how discovering this building ended up being the Bacon and Beer Fest? Uh, yeah. So. In 2009, uh, it's a long time ago, but in 2009, if you had a business, you wanted to be on Twitter talking about it. And I think I had five or 10,000 followers at that point, and um, that meant a lot to restaurants. And uh, I, I, the marketing company that I worked for was across the street from this this big brick building, and I my office looked or my window looked right out on on that building, and I used to stare at it, um, say, geez, we gotta, we got to do something there. And uh, I knew that beer events sold thousands of tickets every weekend in Boston, and figured that if we paired that with bacon, that that would, uh, that would sell more tickets, or it would at least be an event that people outside of the beer world would, would talk about, which ended up being the case. Um, I think it's the rightest I've ever been in my career. Uh, it's all been downhill since then. And tell us, how did you get into food-related stuff in the first place? I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just, um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I, li I like food, but I, I just, um, I had been blogging before, and uh, the blogging that I was doing was uh, general interest. And in the nerdy world of blogging, um, niche blogs always have a following. So if you, uh, if you were to start a blog about um, knitting in New Zealand uh, in the summer, you would have every single person that knitted in the summer in New Zealand really interested in your blog. Um, that was not a niche I could uh, go after, so I, food is a little bit broader. Um, so I, I, it was kind of um, wanting to continue uh, blogging or putting stuff on the internet, but wanting a niche. And food kind of, I, I was interested in food, and so figured that that would be a good push. Yeah. So. Um Tell us about the early days of running the Eat Boston Twitter handle, because I know that was where you made a lot of the relationships that are really important to you today, right? Um, so, so like I said, in, in it's, it's hard to remember now, but in 2009, uh, Twitter and Facebook and social media was this uh, magic silver bullet that everybody thought was going to be... Um, Everybody thought that that was going to be the cure to their business woes. Um, and uh, it, was just, it was just exciting, I think. And, and a lot of uh, restaurants were like, oh, we've got to be on there. And they, they still feel that way now. But it, it, uh, you know, there, was, there was me and Boston Tweet and Hidden Boston with these three Twitter accounts that were talking about stuff to do in Boston. And um, the restaurants would come to us, or we would approach restaurants, and just saying, uh, you know, I have 5,000 Twitter followers. Do you want to run a contest on Monday? 
they that's how I got relationships because they they would want to do that. Yeah. Okay. So then walk us through the early days of this uh, the the beer um, and bacon fest. Like, how did you go from like, hey, that's a cool building, beer, bacon, make it happen, to like actually making it happen? Like, break it down a little bit for for all of us out here. Um, I think I. I guess I, I talked to my boss and I was like, who's our landlord? And then I went and talked to the landlord and I was like, I have 5,000 Twitter followers, I can do this. And they were like, ah, all right. Um, so, <laughs> so I, and then I started inviting restaurants and then I started inviting breweries and um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, I, I haven't thought about it. <laughs> in uh, seven, six years, so I, 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 I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, well, can you tell us a little bit about the pop-up restaurant that followed? Or the pop-up dinners, I guess? Yeah, so, um, uh, so Will Gilson, who's the chef at, at Puritan and Company, um, now he was at the Garden at the Cellar um, previously. He, he, uh, I read an article about him, how he was raising pigs for, to, to butcher to sell at, at uh, Garden at the Cellar, and I thought that was the, I thought it was really cool, um, <laughs> both from a, like a, that's how food should be raised, and a, a marketing perspective, because there wasn't other chefs in Boston doing that. And I saw him at Block 11 one time, and I said, hey, uh, I'm doing this bacon and beer fest, I would like you to do a pig butchery demonstration. And he was like, uh, okay. Um, and we played heavy metal during that, um, the, pi the pig butchery demonstration to, to form the Monsters of Pork, um, which is a heavy metal pork butchery demonstration. Um, and a couple months after Bacon and Beer Fest, he came to me and he said, there's these guys doing these, this pop-up restaurant and I want to do it here's what I think we should do. And his idea was uh, selling tickets to dining, which makes a lot of sense if you've ever run a restaurant, if you knew exactly how many people were gonna be there every night. Um, he, he wanted to open an entire restaurant that, that had ticketing. Um, and I was the only one that he knew that had sold 1,600 tickets to anything. Um, so he, he came to me and he said, here's what I wanna do. I wanna open a restaurant that sells tickets every night, three, three turns a night. And I was like, ah, Boston's pretty small. What if we did it for just a weekend? <laughs> and so then that's how, that's how we started doing pop-up restaurants. Is it, and uh, I went to the, the furniture store next door to where my office was, and I was like, I think this would be a good place for a pop-up restaurant. And I put pop-up restaurants in air quotes, and um, people in other cities were starting to talk about it, but it still wasn't being done in Boston. Um, and I was like, oh, I have 5,000 Twitter followers. <laughs> and they were like, okay, let's try it out. And um, so then we got our friends uh, who were architects and graphic designers to be the waiters. And uh, we had a food truck for that one, but not always. And Will brought uh, some of his, his chef friends. And we just cooked this uh, five course dinner. And, um, oh, and actually, uh, a guy that he invited to come the first night was the general manager of uh, one of the fancier restaurants on Nantucket. And so he was giving us a, cross, a crash course in hospitality, like um, everybody always serves over the right shoulder and you clear over the left shoulder and here's how we should set the tables. And so he, he gave that to me like uh, 30 minutes before we started and then I gave that to the rest of our friends like 15 minutes before we started and that kind of, we had this um, really, really high end service for these pop-up dinners, but at the same time, it was very casual because it wasn't waiters or servers that were doing it. Um, and I, uh, that was really, that was in a, like, that was something that people always commented on, that like the service was so good, but also fun. Um, and I, uh, did, I ans did I answer that question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so when it comes to these kind of events, um, do you like the run-up or do you like the event itself? And you know, what's, for, for those of us who haven't ever done anything like this, what's amazing about it and what 
just sucks <laughs> about the experience. Um, so everything sucks about it. That's that's the first part. Um, I, I go I go through this phase. Um, it's less less like this now, but I go through this phase where, um, or it's like a cycle, um, where I announce the event and everybody's excited, and then I put tickets on sale and. For like five years, every event that I put on sale sold out in 48 hours. Um, and so then I would spend the week after announcing an event and putting on tickets on sale being like, oh, I should do this more. I should do more of these and, and everywhere. I, I can make a living doing this. And then um, the three weeks before the event when I actually have to put the event, do the work of putting it together, I, I think uh, this sucks. I don't want to do this ever again. Um, this, this is terrible. And then the event happens. And the week after the event, I'm like, I don't want to do anything ever again forever. And then uh, the, the week after that, I'm like, ah, this is so boring. <laughs> what, can, what can I do to cause chaos in my life? And then I start another event or, or, or put together another event. Well, really what I need is to um, come up with a concept for an event, like for my own mental, mental health, is to come up for, with a concept for the event uh, right before I announce an event so that I announce the next event uh, during the, the, the run-up when I'm, when I'm still feeling pretty good. And then it's already announced by the time I hate doing events. And then, um, you know, then I'm okay. And, and I do an okay job of that, but also pretty terrible um, because I didn't do any events for most of March, all of April, in the middle of May, and then now I have uh, three or four over the next f five weeks, and then I don't have anything planned <laughs> after that. So it'll be August again before I have an event, and I'll, like in uh, the middle of June, right after Bacon and Beer Fest, I'll get, uh, I'll get bored and depressed and, and, and just like be like, oh, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, um, so tell us then about how Gracie's fits into all of this, and tell us about how you, s how did Gracie's as an ice cream store, not your daughter, come into your life? <laughs> you, d you don't want to hear about how she came, how my daughter came into life. Um, we hope that you will tell us the birthing story in exquisite detail, but maybe not until the end. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> tell us about ice cream first, but then I actually do want us to talk a little bit about being a parent, a working parent. So. So which which part were you kidding about? What? Which part were you kidding about? <laughs> Sorry, bad sarcasm. Tell us about Gracie's, the ice cream store. Period. Thanks. Um, okay, so uh, because I was doing all these food events and had a, a pretty big, I had five thousand Twitter followers. Um, I, I mean, one of the one thing I didn't say about why I like doing the events is because I've always liked selling T-shirts. Um, both the act of designing a T-shirt and then the actual transaction of um, someone walking up to you and then trying to get as much money out of them as possible uh, for 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 the T-shirts, um, and so I've always wanted to do like a, a retail uh, type of uh, type project, um, and I I love ice cream. Um, I love it less now that I own an ice cream store, but. Uh, uh, I used to eat, you know, two quarts of ice cream a week. Um, and so um, I heard about the ice cream store uh, through some friends that a, a guy had uh, this, this idea of opening an ice cream store in Union Square, and I was like, well, that's a, a no-brainer. Um, and so I, kinda, I got involved that way and um, kind of... Uh, took over the project uh, to a certain extent so that it wasn't really, um, it was more my vision of an ice cream store uh, at that point. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, so, um, yeah, tell us about what it took to open it and then what, what makes Gracie's different than, you know, your average ice cream store? And how did you, how did you come up with those differentiators? Um, I, I'm not kidding. Um, 
if you're thinking about opening a business, be very, 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 very certain that you want to open a business because it's terrible um, to open a business. Owning a business is not so bad, but uh, the process of, of getting from like walking into the city and saying, hey, we want to do this, to actually being allowed to open the store, is, it's garbage. Um, and it's really agonizing, and you will spend at least, at least a month being totally ready to be open, uh, and someone is not allowing you to open, and it, that's like the worst thing in the world. Um, as far as, and I, I, don't mean to, I don't mean to understate that point. I am serious about that. Um, as far as what makes us different, uh, until, <laughs> un, un, until about a week and a half ago, we were the only place in Somerville that was making ice cream. Um, now that uh, Tip and Cow opened, and then uh, Forge is opening pretty soon, so there'll be plenty of uh, people making their own ice cream in Somerville. Um, what makes us different, I think, is uh, I, I think that uh, I how many people have been to Gracie's? Why haven't you been? Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, that's true. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so I guess uh, what what makes us a little bit different is that we take flavors that are straight flavors uh, that you could find at any ice cream parlor in America, and we twist them a little bit one way or the other. Um, and we don't do that with all of our flavors, but that's kind of how that's kind of how I think about flavor creation. Um, one of the things that I, I mean, we get, we buy local as much as possible. And when I say that, uh, <laughs> I, we do do that. But also, we buy a lot of stuff from Market Basket uh, to put into the ice cream, which is about as local as you can get to us. And um, when I'm there uh, buying ingredients, I will see something and then try and figure out how to use that. So um, I knew, like a couple, couple last year sometime, I knew that we had to make a sorbet, because uh, we have one sorbet at all times. And um, I saw the black pepper, and I was like, well, how can we, how can we use that? And I um, saw the grapefruit juice, and I said, maybe we can make grapefruit black pepper sorbet. And then I Googled it to see if that was a thing. Um, and it isn't really, um, but but it tastes okay. Um, so I think what makes us different is, at, at least uh, I have I have uh, other partners who will say differently about the the ice cream. Uh, the ice cream that I like has lots of stuff in it: um, cookies, candy, cereal, that kind of thing. Um, and so I think a devotion to putting stuff into ice cream is what makes us a little bit different. Yeah, I saw your Easter candy. Um, they also, Gracie's has really nice social media, probably because you have 5,000 Twitter followers, so. <laughs> and they do, really, they do really nice storytelling around that. Okay, so you do a bunch of stuff, and what, like, what does your day look like? You know, wh you wake up, and then what happens next? Um, well, I have, my wife and I have a, a three-month-old and a three-year-old, um, so my day, looks like uh, one of the kids wakes up, and then we try and go back to sleep, the whole family. And then one of the kids wakes up again, and we try to, try to go back to sleep. Um, so then around 7 or 8 o'clock, uh, everybody's pretty, up at, pretty much up at that time. And um, I get Gracie ready for school with uh, haranguing her to finish her Cheerios. And then I walk her up to daycare. Uh, which is Pooh and Friends across the street from Highland Kitchen. Uh, then I go for a walk and walk home. And um, get distracted on the internet for the rest of the day, I think. Um, and then about 5.30, go up to daycare, pick up Gracie, and then we go to the park. Uh, that's Monday, Wednesday, Thursday. Tuesdays, uh, she's home all day, and so we hang out at the park all day. Um, and then Friday, I take off. <laughs> I, I get distracted on the internet on Fridays. Um, I guess with 
your question, uh, like, what does the day look like? You mean, um, how do I choose what to work on? Or yeah. so I guess it's um, I have uh, let's see, maybe two or three defined projects at this time, and um, it's basically putting out fires. I I try not to let something get until it's the size uh, or like the it's a big enough problem that it's a fire. But um, like today, uh, so one of the things about owning a business is you have to pay sales tax every month, and um, it's it's easy. It takes 10 minutes, but it's very important that you do it because um, otherwise you get in trouble. Uh, and um, you do that on the 20th of every month, and I have my alarm set to go off on the 18th to remind me. I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember <laughs> what I did today. Um, for the beer garden, which I should have done in April. So I, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's, uh, all of these projects have milestones, and I just try and keep on top of all the milestones and and not push anything too far late. Does that make sense? So how do you decide what to take on and then what to what to slough off? Like, and have you are there rejected projects that are in the Aaron Cohen history? Um, do you mean th is there stuff that I want to do that I haven't done, or is there stuff that someone was like you should do this and I said no to? More, you know, everything that you're doing now, right? The beer and bacon fest, the whiskey rebellion, the Gracie's. I mean, what have been the, hey, I did this for a while, and now I rejected it. Um, and then how do you decide if something exciting comes along? How do you decide what you want to do? Like, and what's, yeah, what's your go or no go decision like? Um, give me one second, because I have an answer to this. That uh, I've thought about, but I haven't said out loud, I think. Um, so normally, uh, Okay, so the, the art gallery hasn't been alive uh, for about two years um, since the time of uh, since the time of Gracie's, and I think that one of the reasons and and then before that um, the the blog that I maintained every day from 2004 to 2012 that kind of died as well um, right around the same time as the or maybe 2014. Right around the same time as uh, a bacon and beer fest wasn't, I had to postpone a bacon and beer fest because uh, the venue didn't get the permits, which was uh, a total disaster. And um, I think that I stopped blogging because I didn't want to um, pretend to be excited about anything because I, I was like really frustrated with this one project. Um, and then the art gallery, kind of the same way, uh, I didn't want to pretend to be excited about the art gallery and try and convince people to, to come and buy art when uh, like when we were struggling to get Gracie's open. It was like uh, I was not feeling good about stuff and um, I didn't want to push something out else out. Uh, the, the food events kept going because that that's how I make all my money, so it was <laughs> like that's my job. Um, so I, I think, uh, how do I, that wasn't the question that you asked, but I answered the question that I asked myself, which is um, get over it. Um, I guess, I think, I, I don't know, because I don't, I don't really ever not do something, I don't really ever not do something that uh, I thought of I just maybe haven't done it yet, or maybe that's how I think about it. Um, I don't have an example. Okay, so then one last question for me. Um, what do you advise this portfolio career of yours? And for other folks out there who, you know, might have creative ideas and are thinking about doing their own independent thing, what do you think they should know? Uh, you have to pay estimated taxes on a quarterly basis, um, and it's like a lot more money than you would expect it to be. So that's uh, that's my advice. Um, 
Yeah, I think you should do it. I think I think you should. I think you should do it because it's it's everybody has to have a job. Well, most people have to have a job, and most people have to work. And um, if you want if you want to do something, it's it's not it's not impossible. It may be hard, but it's not impossible. And you just have to figure out how to actualize the idea. So if uh, if you really want to start that knitting blog about summer knitting in New Zealand, you can do it. You can do it. Um, and I don't mean to be a, a motivational speaker, but it, it's, you know, like when, when you ask, like, how do you, how do you, how do you do it? It's it, like, I, this, the same question to me is like, you, you, you get up and go to work every morning because that's, that's what you do. And, um, you know, you, yes, I advise it. Okay, so pay your quarterly taxes. 